Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today at this discussion on reparations for black and brown people in the United States and how we can progress from meaningful conversation and begin to take action. I am Chrissy Jackson. I am an activist, organizer, co-founder, and co-director of the Truth Telling Project. The Truth Telling Project was born out of Ferguson after the murder of Michael Brown Jr. Um, we are a community of social justice activists, educators, clergy members, and policymakers, and local committee citizens whose lives have all been affected by structural violence. Now, as an organization, our mission is to implement and sustain grassroots community centered truth home processes as a way to amplify voices about structural violence. And we do that by sharing stories, we facilitate healing, um, support activists on the ground, educate and seek justice. So when we talk about structural violence, we are referring to the systematic ways in which social structures harm and disadvantage individuals. Oftentimes, this is subtle and invisible to those of us who are not aware about how we're being affected by it, and those of us who are also unaware about how we are perpetuating it in our current lifestyles. So, uh, for example, slavery, mass incarceration, police violence, and the government responding to our outrage with militarized force are all examples of direct structural violence. Racism, housing inequalities, the school to prison pipeline, and unjust legal system are all examples of indirect structural violence. Now, as we move forward with demands for reparations, it is important to listen to the voices that have been directly affected by structural violence. Their stories are the real, have been and still are being harmed by this by the systems that have been put in place. So um, with that said, I can say that the Truth Selling Project is extremely excited and grateful to be working together with the Fellow Reconciliation and listening to our incredible panelists today about how we can begin to take action towards reparations. And I would like to invite you all to, again, listen and um, be prepared to take action. Um, feel free to stay, or please stay until the end of this call, and we will have next steps available for you. Now, I'd like to introduce an incredible, incredible activist, intellectual, a mentor, and a really good friend of mine, David J. Raglan, who is also the senior Rustin Bayard Fellow at the Fellowship of Reconciliation. David, go ahead and take it away. Thank you, Chrissy. Um, thank everyone for being here. Um, and, you know, I just want to also let folks know that in addition, um, if folks don't know about Fellowship of Reconciliation, it is um, the oldest interfaith uh, peace organization. Um, and I recently uh, started as the Bayard Rustin Fellow. And uh, what I wanted to kind of share a little bit, how did we get here? Um, is uh, just through conversations um, right after Michael Brown was killed, um, ended up connecting in a very profound way with some of the folks uh, like Reverend Sekou and Ethan and um, uh, Kristen, who is the current ED of Fellowship of Reconciliation. And one of the understandings that developed over time um, from the work in the Truth Telling Project. We were um, looking at how um, folks are telling their stories and what does truth mean in this particular moment. And for us, you, you know, it was people told their stories and a lot of folks were really pressing us to talk about and push toward forgiveness. And that was something that was important to me. Uh, I thought it was an important part of healing, uh, but some of myself and some of the folks in Ferguson as well, we thought that it was important that truth telling was important. But also after people hear your stories, what's next? How do we actually get to reconciliation when there is no prior relationship or the relationship is one of oppression. And so the conversation had been on our minds about reparations and 
we have been honored that the public discourse has pushed um, us all to think more deeply and profoundly about repar what reparations means in our particular time. And one of the things I just wanted to kind of share was we began thinking of a vision for what does reparation looks, look like now? And I had conversations with uh, folks like Jody Geddes, who's also a part of our partnership and she represents restorative justice for Oakland youth and coming to the table project and other folks like that. Um, and even some of the public discourse. And I think there, there um, some folks like um, the Southern Reparations Loan Fund um, that Ed um, Whitfield runs uh, down in Greensboro, North Carolina, who we met when we were connecting with um, the folks who ran their Truth and Reconciliation Commission. But we believe that reparations is important to heal moral injury, which Rita Brock talks about. And that moral injury that extends from slavery um, and the, the, the new Jim Crow and the old Jim Crow. Um, and how do we actually deal with folks' truth after they've told their story, but still have to go home to the same material conditions? And I, I just want to point out that uh, reparations, as conceived by some of the groups who are doing it now, has not always and is not always necessarily money. As Georgetown, um, as some of the folks at Georgetown who have um, tried to um, help us understand by their acknowledgement of their part in slavery. But one of the other things and um, understandings that we need to know is that uh, welfare is not reparations. Uh, welfare for those who fall through the cracks and have been suffering is what any decent society does. Equity is not welfare. Equity is provided for as a basic right um, in our law. Reparations is restitution for past harms that uh, have affected uh, multiple generations and that that trauma has emerged from. So our white allies and, and community members, what does it look like to help heal that moral harm? And this is one of the first conversations that we'll be having that tries to suss out that and tries to share um, from some of the experts and folks who, around the country who've been thinking deeply and working on these issues. Um, and I'm gonna stop talking here, uh, cause I'm a host and I wanna introduce a, a good friend of mine and somebody that I admire deeply. We have a number of guests um, and I'm just gonna say their names right now and there'll be a more extensive um, uh, introduction right before they speak, but we have on this call today, in addition to Chrissy Jackson, we have Dr. Iva Carruthers, who's coming next, and I'll share her bio with you. But we also have Dr. Amokar Shabazz, uh, and we also have uh, Ms. Jody Geddes, who's um, at Arjoy, and we also have uh, Luca, Reverend Lucas Johnson, who is uh, one of the coordinator or the coordinator for International Fellowship of Reconciliation. But Dr. Ira Carruthers, as many of you know, um, is a trailblazer. She's the Secretary General of the Samuel DeWitt Proctor Conference. And that organization engages uh, progressive African-American faith leaders in a social justice lens. She's also the founder and director of Lewis House and, and a trustee of Chicago Theological Seminary Kwame Nkrumah Academy and Shared Interests. Uh, she's also a professor emeritus and former chair of sociology, um, of the sociology department at Northeastern Illinois University. 
author, editor of many publications in sociology um, and African-American history and theology. Uh, she's also one of the delegates to the 2001 United Nations World Conference Against Racism, Racial Discrimination, Xenophobia, and Related Intolerance. And I just want to let you all know how much impact she's had in helping us think about the decade for people of African descent. So it's with great pleasure that I introduce my friend and someone I look up to, Dr. Ivor Carruthers. Thank you so much, David. Can you hear me? We're all, we're all good. Yes, yes. Very good. Uh, thank you, and, and, and to all of you who are there in the uh, audience as participants, and certainly to my colleagues that I can see, uh, I am just delighted and humbled by uh, the capacity for us to be together. Uh, Lucas, hello, and it's so good to see you always. We always see each other in various parts of the world. It's indeed a pleasure to see you and uh, to know that, that you answered the call, the leadership call to, uh, to go into new territory to, uh, for such a time as this. And so we really appreciate the leadership of your organization. Uh, I am humbled to be a part of this conversation because it means that uh, the work that each of us has been doing uh, on the ground individually is coming together uh, in a way that has great potential for a collective impact. And so, um, it's uh, real uh, important, I think, that as I have thought about where do we go from here, that the, the, the two things I struggle with is how to facilitate the collaboration that this kind of conversation uh, represents, and at the same time, uh, really acknowledge and address the woundedness and the need for our healing, uh, foundationally at a spiritual level, but certainly materially as well. Uh, I'm not sure exactly, David, uh, how much time you wanted uh, the, us who are speaking to just frame our remarks, but you want to give me a framework for that? Um, about 10 minutes. Okay, no more than 10. You don't have to worry about that for me. Let me just say, uh, I am actually in the midst of planning uh, to receive on February 12th about 1,000 clergy and faith leaders in Memphis uh, for our 15th annual convening. And that 15th commemoration of our organization, the Samuel DeWitt Proctor Conference, is in the backdrop, of course, as you know, of the 50th year commemoration activities of the sanitation worker strike and the um, assassination of Martin Luther King. Uh, as a pre-conference activity, tomorrow morning I fly out and we are hosting the launch of our first truth-telling commission around the issue, in this case, of racial economic justice. And that truth-telling commission will uh, begin in Memphis and in March, in connection and collaboration with the, uh, the objectives of the Decade of People of African Descent and the United Nations uh, truth-telling processes and so forth, we will host an additional two panels to deepen the conversation around our lens of truth telling around racial economic justice. The vision for that grows out of um, our affirmation that, it, that at this point in time, one of the things that's very necessary in the faith community is for us to recognize that the work that we are doing is sacred work and that we have got to figure out better ways to get communities of faith to understand and to accept greater responsibility for how we have these kinds of conversations, not in narrow terms, but in broader and interdisciplinary terms that really speak to holistic, uh, transformative community uh, a change uh, for the globe, not, not just about where you live, but really in terms of the globe. So it's in, within the context of what we call our sacred memory work that we are launching uh, our truth telling process. Um, I think David mentioned that in 2001, I was one of the, um, in fact, at the time, I think there were only three Af people of African descent from the United States who had delegate status on the floor at the UN, um, which was a shame, which gave me a vision that our organization would seek to get 
uh, UN NGO status, which we have now. Um, but we need to encourage more and more people to do that. But I was there um, representing a shared interest as a delegate, which is an organization that deals with uh, reconstruction, reconciliation, and issues of restoration, uh, restorative, reparative justice in South Africa. And uh, as a part of that, I had done a little piece called The Church and Reparations. And that piece was uh, translated into three languages and distributed. And it was a way for um, uh, some of us to begin to articulate what reparations meant beyond uh, somebody's notion that it just meant some financial compensation. And in fact, uh, one of the quotes that I really love is a quote from uh, Martin Luther King's Where Do We Go From Here, in which he says that, you know, you can never pay us enough uh, for the damage and the harm that has been done. So it's clearly uh, not about just money. Um, but it was from that UN um, um, Durban conference that uh, those of us who were there from the United States um, continued the conversation, and some of that has now emerged into a commission that I sit on, which is the National African American Reparations Commission. That's under the aegis of um, and the guidance and leadership of Ron Daniels and the Institute of the Black World. And so our commission work has been the work that uh, connected and affirmed um, um, the, uh, the work of, of John Conyers and his efforts. Um, to continue to put into the record H.R. Uh, 40, uh, up until us now talking about a different iteration of that, that acknowledges that even though the United States did nothing, many of us collectively have done something to build the, our own case. And certainly um, the uh, NARC, the National African American Reparations Commission, is just one of the commissions in the global context of people of African descent who are engaged in this work. Um, and there are reparations commissions all over the globe. Uh, and we have in fact met with um, many of them. But I must say that um, the, the CARICOM Reparations Commission and the work that Sir Henry Beckles, um, uh, Sir Hillary Beckles has led on behalf of the presidents of the Caribbean has, has been really landmark and benchmark in terms of how we frame um, what reparatory justice looks like. Um, and so um, I want to, to suggest that part of the conversation uh, from my perspective is to build bridges of collaboration on the one hand, but at the same time, I think we have to manage individually and collectively what it means for us to be wounded warriors trying to speak at the same time on behalf of wounded people. And the challenge that that gives to all of us to create healing and sacred spaces where we can be whole. And at the same time where we can go into spaces and say we are wounded. And so much of that is the ways in which the Proctor Conference as a faith inspired organization is attempting to create this agenda around truth telling an agenda around justice and agenda around reparatory justice and reparations, all as a step towards ultimately what we all envision as reconciliation of the beloved community. Um, a few months ago, I was inspired that uh, I was one of the persons invited to come to the UN um, who was meeting um, in partnership with the World Council of Churches. And the umbrella concept that we were asked to speak on was the concept of Afrophobia. And so Afrophobia is a construct that I think is useful as we have this conversation because it speaks to the various myriad ways in which um, the fear of African people um, has, is, is undergirding a lot of the systemic uh, forces of evil um, that are um, continuing to be strengthened um, by voices and persons in power and power and principalities, so to speak. Um, some of it are going on right now, probably, as we're having this conversation, um, as it relates to uh, the, the, the whole way in which so much of this is at the unconscious level. 
and trying to figure out how to penetrate people's souls, people's spirits, to, to challenge them and to name evil, evil. And so um, I wanna put on the table for this conversation and just to share with, with great transparency that I have no problem as a sociologist and as a theologian to identify and name evil and to identify and name the markers which can allow a society to very quietly uh, slip into ethnic cleansing and slip into genocide. And so I think it is incumbent upon us as we have this conversation to, uh, to ignore the markers that are before us as it relates to what's happening very uh, quietly and yet in very sinister, deep ways uh, penetrating the, the very possibilities of not just human dignity, but human survival of people of African descent. Um, tomorrow we go to Memphis, we'll have the Truth Telling Commission. I'm really happy that uh, with a phone call uh, from my chair, uh, Dr. Freddie Haynes and myself to Roland Martin, he caught the vision and Roland Martin is gonna meet us tomorrow. And so tomorrow at the National Civil Rights Museum after we close down the hearings, we're actually gonna have a town hall meeting that will be live streamed. And so we hope that this becomes a model whereby part of the contribution that Proctor is making to our collective work together is to at least um, make sure that the lens, the voice, and the agency of the prophetic tradition of the Black church is present and accounted for. Um, regardless of the outcome, history will say that some of us spoke up and stood up and knelt. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Shabazz. Thank you for being on the call and sharing your voice and experience. Um, next, we have Dr. Amilkar Shabazz. Oh, excuse me, um, Dr. Carruthers. I'm sorry, I'm about to uh, introduce Dr. Shabazz. Um, Dr. Shabazz is a professor at the W.E.B. Du Bois Department of the Afro-American Studies at the University of Massachusetts Amherst and he currently serves Council for Black Studies, and the premier, which is the premier organization of Africana Studies scholars. So his book includes, his books, plural, include the 40 Acres Documents. He um, co-edited that with Amari Abdeli, and one of the, he's one of the leading activists and theorists of reparations in the 20th century. Oh, we can see his book right here. <laughs> uh, all right. Go ahead and take it away, Dr. Shabazz. Oh, thank you. And, and, and like uh, my, uh, my sister, uh, Dr. Carruthers, I also uh, am very humbled and uh, uh, pleased at the same time to be um, on this uh, wonderful panel with uh, people with uh, very uh, great perspectives uh, to add on this. It is really heartening, too, to hear uh, where we are with members of the faith community and how they're putting together uh, the, 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 the idea of reparative justice and spreading that um, out to people in the, uh, in the community, spreading that to, uh, to their parishioners, their uh, uh, congregations, and, uh, and really trying to spread that throughout uh, throughout the world. I'd like to speak uh, as someone who bears witness for at least the last 30 years to how this idea of, uh, of reparations, of reparative justice uh, for enslavement and racial oppression even after shadow slavery was outlawed, uh, as it has emerged over the last 30 uh, or, or more years. Um, I first come into uh, uh, the, the, the awareness of our struggles for, um, uh, for, for reparations in the 1970s, uh, both as an undergraduate student taking Black Studies classes at the University of Texas at Austin, uh, as well as a community activist in Austin, Texas, 
And then as I moved around and began to, to meet uh, people uh, around the country, one of my first events that I attended in uh, summer of 1980 was a meeting of an organization no longer really active, at least in that name. It's called the National Black Political Assembly. And it met in New Orleans. And um, at that uh, uh, meeting in summer of 1980, uh, I had the occasion, first time occasion there to meet Queen Mother Audley Moore. Queen Mother Moore, uh, from, originally from Louisiana, but more widely known as an activist in, uh, in Harlem, is, uh, it was in fact a, one of the uh, a great uh, activists and voices for reparations as far back in, in, in time as the 40s and 50s and 60s. She was a part of, uh, of, of campaigns and a part of um, sharing knowledge and, and pushing people about this idea of what was owed, the wrongful taking from people of African descent in, in the United States, uh, the wrongful taking that slavery and Jim Crow oppression represented, and the need to repair uh, us uh, for that wrongful taking. And so the uh, um, the, the voice of Queen Mother Moore rings in my ears from as far back as, uh, as 1980. Um, I further went on to meet people uh, such in the struggle, such as Imari Obadeli. And Imari Obadeli, uh, in one of his books, um, was Foundations of the Black Nation uh, that he wrote in 1972. And in this uh, book, it includes the information on the anti-depression program of the Republic of New Africa that was presented uh, to select members of the US Congress in June of 1972. And it, that was in three acts. And act, the third act of that uh, legislative request was an act authorizing payment of $300 billion in reparations for slavery and unjust war against the black nation uh, to the Republic of New Africa. So that, that goes back to 1972. And an act authorizing negotiations uh, was, a, was a further step from that. Fast forward from that in, in 1972 to a book that Imari Obadeli put together with another very, very close, two very close comrades of mine, um, Shokwe, uh, attorney Shokwe Lumumba, now deceased, and attorney Inkechi Taifa. And uh, this book, Reparations Yes, was, uh, uh, um, it was a, a book with the legal and political reasons why new Africans, black people in the United States should be paid now for the enslavement of our ancestors and for war against us after slavery. And there was in this document, um, it included both the U.S. Act giving reparations to the Japanese, the Conyers Reparations Study Bill, once known as H.R. 40, House Resolution 40, uh, which was a study bill for reparations from John uh, um, uh, Rep uh, Representative Conyers, and then finally, a draft reparations bill that they worked on, uh, uh, Mario Bedelli, Shokwe Lumumba, and Nkechi. Taifa. So this uh, came out back in 1987, I believe, and I was uh, actively a part of that work with, with uh, uh, Sister Taifa uh, and brothers uh, Obadeli and Lumumba. Um, and then going on from there, we came out uh, some years a little bit uh, after that with the 40 Acres documents that includes the um, field order from uh, General Sherman, uh, Secretary of War Edwin Stanton, uh, Andrew Johnson, U.S. President, his veto of the Freedmen's Bill, as well as uh, a statement by Henry Adams, a committee leader that testified for reparations. This is back in the 1860s. So uh, um, we, these were uh, little efforts by activists and scholars uh, like Dr. Obadeli and Attorney Lumumba and, and, and Attorney uh, uh, Taifa to uh, that at that time, very few uh, people <laughs> were really listening to us or reading us. I'll just be honest and frank about that. Um, <clears throat> but 
again, going into the 90s, going uh, since the turn of the millennium as we enter the 21st century, I have seen this uh, I've seen a movement over these last uh, 30 uh, to 40 years that is really quite impressive. So can we move this from conversation to action? Oh, yes, we can. Oh, yes, we can. I've seen it move from uh, 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 intellectual conversations and political uh, theorizing and, and arguments now to where people not only in the United States but outside the United States are really engaging these issues on legal levels uh, from the standpoint of scholars of economics uh, like uh, Richard America who once had um, uh, a book on the, uh, the, the, the racial wealth gap uh, to my own mentor at Duke University, uh, Sandy Darity, uh, Dr. William Darity Jr. Um, there are uh, uh, many, many, many scholars now coming to uh, applying their different disciplinary techniques, uh, 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 economics, political economy, uh, political science, um, uh, legal scholars, um, uh, to, to historians, are uh, all stepping forward and bringing this. So I think we, we've, we've, we've been coming, I bear witness to how this conversation has grown and is um, and, and has attracted a very a, a much broader audience than what we had 30 to 35 40 years ago so can we move to action yes we can i want to talk about a, one action area that i'm a part of as um vice president of the national council for black studies national council for black studies was established in 1975 working to give uh coherence and a space for African studies scholars across the country to come together and to define and to build this nascent uh, um, uh, knowledge project we call uh, Black Studies, Africana Studies. And every year we meet, and we've met continuously since 1975, we're meeting this upcoming uh, March uh, in, in, in Atlanta. And uh, consistently, I have seen panel sessions and plenaries and, and uh, presentations by scholars uh, on, the, on, on reparations. And we will, have we will have presentations again there. We have issued statements as in CBS on uh, the International Year and then the International Decade for People of African Descent. And within that, uh, uh, the struggle for reparations has been something that we have um, uh, put out statements on for our entire membership. And, 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 and so again, I see within the hundreds of, of programs and departments of black, uh, black studies across the country, more and more this issue of reparative justice, the theory, the practice of it, the historical scholarship on it, the social science research is becoming a more and more prominent facet of the work of Africana Studies scholars. And I'll just um, I'll, uh, put that out for right now at this uh, uh, vantage point and let others add to the conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Shabazz. Uh, we just deeply, deeply appreciate um, your work. And let me, let me just make sure my video is going to. Um, and I, I can testify just from sitting with you that year ago <laughs> in Amherst, um, hearing the deepness of, of this work and seeing um, how important the work you, know, you and Dr. Carruthers uh, trailblazing and laying the foundation so we can think about uh, what's next. And with that, I want to introduce um, Reverend Lucas Johnson, um, who um, Lucas is a brilliant, um, brilliant uh, nonviolence uh, scholar and activist, and he's a coordinator for the International Fellowship of Reconciliation, a longtime um, minister, and um, he has been um, around and involved uh, um, from a spiritual perspective, um, just as a steward and as an important a member of this community and leader um, and, and thought partner um, in this work as we've been thinking about um, what does uh, reparations look like. And in our work together, um, 
we were just emailing each other and um, he's been one of the important folks to um, help us think deeply uh, and make sure that we're connecting the dots. Um, with that, Brother Lucas. Good evening, everyone. Um, I, I'm very, very grateful for this chance to be on this call, uh, particularly to see your face, uh, Mother Iva, and to, to share this space with you. Uh, it, it brings my heart so much joy uh, to hear from you and to learn from you again. I want to thank you and Dr. Shabazz for uh, all the work that you've done as, as our two elders on the call. Uh, I'm grateful for the path that you've laid for us uh, so that we can walk alongside you as we continue this journey uh, towards reparation. So I'm, I'm deeply grateful for you. And I know that I, I, I also speak for, for uh, the younger folks uh, on this panel um, uh, with that mm -hmm. gratitude. Um, I think that uh, I'll begin by saying, you know, it's not, uh, it may not be so matter of fact for, for people why uh, the, the Fellowship of Reconciliation or my role as the international coordinator of, of this uh, old interfaith peace organization should be engaged in a conversation about reparations. Um, Mother Ivor, you spoke to, um, uh, you, 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 you reminded me of something you, when you were talking about uh, Dr. King's uh, speech, where we go from here. And I don't know if you were referencing the speech or the book, but, but I was thinking about the speech. And I, I, while you were talking, I, I, I went back and I, I found this, this quote. Um, it's not the quote that you, you called our attention to, it's a different one, where he says, a nation that will keep people in slavery for 244 years will thingify them and make them things. And therefore they will exploit them and poor people generally economically. And the nation that will exploit economically will have to have foreign investments and everything else. And it will have to use its military might to protect them. And all of these problems are tied together. And so it's not, it's not, uh, incidental that we should be engaged in a conversation about the history and the legacy of structural violence towards African people. And it's not incidental that we should be seeking remedy and seeking repair on many different levels. I think it's something, something that it's, it's essential to our work. I think one of the other important things that um, that Dr. Carruthers also spoke to, that both, both Dr. Carruthers and Dr. Shabazz spoke to, is the importance of, of this being a global conversation. If, if we think, if, 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 if we take Ubuntu seriously, if we take the, the African proverb and, 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 and theological orientation that I am because we are, if we take that seriously, then we have to frame our conversation about the harm done in a way that is radically different than the Western orientation of thinking. It's not harm done to you or to me, it's harm done to, to an us, to an us that transcends our US identity. And that's a very essential uh, thing for us to understand. If we were to win and gain material reparations for uh, African descendants in the United States, but the structure of the United States didn't change, we will not have won. Because the harm done to us is, at the, is, is, is essential to the harmful, destructive, racist foreign policy that has fueled so much violence and pain around the world. And so what we have to do, what this conversation is also about is a, is a, 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 a reorientation, a, a, a both, a, both a psychological and spiritual reorientation of our thinking. I, I feel that, um, you know, on, on, uh, I don't want to diminish the material conversation. That, that's, that's, that's critical. That's important. 
But I do want us to understand that when we have this conversation, and, I, and, I, and I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about us as, as, as Black Americans in particular, I'm thinking about uh, all of us involved in this. We have to remember that while harm was being done to us, harm was being done to our brothers in Brazil, harm was being done to our sisters in Haiti, harm was being done uh, to our people throughout the Americas and people all over the globe. Harm started being done on the African continent. And I think that when we do that and when we start to have these conversations, it helps us understand the depth with which we have to engage this discussion. It also greatly complicates the conversation in a, in a, in a challenging but, but, but beautiful way. Uh, I'm thinking about, uh, you, know, you know, whenever I would complain about things getting more complicated, uh, Vincent Harding used to remind me that it, it, nobody ever said it was going to be easy, right? So, <laughs> so, and I, you know, I know our elders know this already, but for me, it's one of the things that I'm still remembering and still having to learn. So one of the things that we have to do in this is, is we have to, to, to learn to sort of carry uh, the, the global community and the global conversation with us as we're, as we're pursuing these, these conversations. I think the other thing I wanted to, to speak to, um, and, I, and I think my, I'm running close to my 10 minutes here, but the other thing I wanted to speak to was uh, uh, Dr. Carruthers men mentioned the Durban Conference. And, and uh, I think there are two important things that, there are many important things that came out of that conference, but two that I think it's, that, that have been referenced, but I wanna, I wanna specifically name and lift up. One is the fact that, you know, the, 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 one of the things that the conference said, there was a recommendation to, to the, the High Commissioner for Human Rights that a working group be formed uh, that would focus on uh, uh, the, 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 the situation facing people of African descent around the world. Now that working group was formed uh, in 2016, that working group came to the United States and made a lot of headlines because that working group, after studying the situation, after traveling around the country, made a statement that the United States government uh, needed to, cons to, to revisit and, and institute a program of reparations for people of African descent. I wanna call attention to that. I think that's a, that was an, a very important moment. Um, the second thing I, I wanted to name is, is, the, is the naming, and this is something that would, would flow from all of that, is the naming of 2015 to 2024 as the international decade for people of African descent. And this is, this is, a, this is a decade that, is, that was uh, declared by the UN General Assembly. Uh, and, and it, along with that, has come a tremendous amount of uh, opportunities uh, uh, for conversations and, 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 and uh, exchange. I think um, we are we are in the midst of a of a very important moment and a, a very important opportunity that I see. I, I'm I, I'm calling from from I'm, I'm joining this conversation from Amsterdam and uh, and my life right now is in Europe and so if my thoughts are a bit rambling it's because it's one a.m. for me uh, so forgive me for that <laughs> but you know I'm 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 deeply engaged and and conversations uh, with the African diaspora here and the anti-racism movements here. And in my capacity as coordinator for, for I4, uh, that work uh, brings me to the UN in Geneva very often in, in New York as well, and, and with our members around the world. And one of the things that that, that has shown me is, is the particular moment where, that we're in, where we have an opportunity to have conversations that, that, um, well, let, let me explain a little bit more about the opportunity. The opportunity is, is, is because we, it's, 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 it's an opportunity, but it's also a matter of, of uh, we have to have these conversations. It's a matter of, 
uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Not obligation, uh, but but th- things are such where where there's a there's a there's there's an impatience uh, with the status quo, and there's an exposure of the status quo uh, not being able to meet the needs of 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 people, and 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 the and the and the and the fact that that the racism, Afrophobia, the fact that these things have persisted. Um, has has created a great uh, awakening for people of African descent um, and and allies around the world, and 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 I feel like we're in the midst of an opportunity. And I and I don't want to. It's hard for me to say that because I don't want to make it sound as if the struggle hasn't always been there. Of course it has, but but I do believe that 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 this is a moment, um, and and I'm looking forward to to how we can respond to that moment. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lucas. That was amazing. Um, next, we're going to have Jody Geddes. Um, Jody Geddes is a truth telling, radical healing, and reparations project lead for the restorative justice of Oakland youth. And um, in addition to that, she's also on the board, she's the board president of uh, Coming to the Table. So looking forward to hearing what she has to say on the subject. Go ahead. Thank you, Chrissy. Um, I definitely concur with Lucas, really giving thanks and grace um, to our elders on this call right now and also our elders who have passed on. I think if it wasn't for the dreaming and the thinking that you all did and the work that you put in, um, I would not be led here. I greatly believe that this work is my life journey um, and I'm continuing to listen to that call no matter how difficult it has been. Um, So much of what you said, Lucas, really resonated with me um, within my heart space. And really just thinking about um, that Dr. King's quote, of how we, I think in many ways, black folks in the US and other places as well, right, have been made a thing. And I also believe that if it wasn't um, sad to say for the murder of Mike Brown, that some of these conversations that are coming to the surface in communities that have never had them, it would not have happened. Um, I think there was this shift in the universe that happened. and it's called all of us, no matter where we come from and what we look like to rise up and to stand up um, and to say that healing is needed. We've always talked about justice and the way that we've talked about justice has often been through a systemic lens that only calls for justice in a situation or justice in a moment instead of justice that requires repair and acknowledgement, right? So the justice we talk about doesn't create space for folks to be held accountable. It doesn't create space for the naming of evil that is evil. And I think what we're doing with reparations right now is a reimagining of the world that we want to create, a reimagining without boundaries and limits and barriers. Um, And for me, that's incredibly important because that reimagining doesn't, um, it doesn't beg for it to happen in my time, but it is thinking about all of the seven generations forward and what we can learn from the seven generations. Um, that have come before us. And so I feel really grateful to feel filled up by the universe, by the the world around me to say, Jody, reimagine, right? And also do that in community. And so I think about growing up in Brooklyn, New York, where I felt like there was a lot of imagining happening, um, but it was one that we couldn't feel like um, there was a moment it was gonna be a reality. And I think it's because we were holding space just for each other, there was no one else holding space for us. And so I feel really blessed by the universe to be a vessel to sit in community and do restorative justice work that is centered within an anti-racist, anti-biased lens to hold space for that imagining to happen for folks who have never had it, right? To say that this trauma, this and this trauma is real and there is a way that we can and break free from that. Um, that restorative justice for open youth that serve as just telling racial healing and reparations project lead. That's a lot. That's not the only three areas we focus in when it comes to our truth telling work. Um, and so much respect definitely to the truth telling project. I think 
you all have been an example for us. It's our joy about what it means to show up and do this work and to tell the truth, but also recognize the telling of the truth is action because I think folks often diminish the telling of truth and the uncovering of what is what is truth. work has been today is transforming justice and they're alone in these pockets in the world and we are not and so we are doing this network mapping for us to be able to examine um and elevate the work that people are doing one to deepen the relationships that folks already have with each other but also to extend support for those who are on the periphery that feel like they have no support but are seeing a need in their community for healing and reconciliation um, and through that it's been amazing to see how many people named reparations as a high priority area um, and also how many of those organizations work with an intersectional lens what does it mean to engage with reparations through a restorative justice lens and those are usually conversations we are not having, having and we often separate. And so that's one of the things that I've really discovered through the research and need for folks to want to deepen their practice and healing, particularly through the lens of restorative justice approach. And with that, wanting to be more engaged in reparations in intersectional ways. And I think this is a space where I've seen elders and young people sit down to reimagine and begin to think about reparations. Um, you, know, you might be asking where did this come from? Um, there was a gathering in 2016 in Richmond, Virginia, for very specific reasons when we think about the history of Richmond, Virginia. Dr. Carruthers was there as well as David Raglan and a few other folks. And we were doing a lot of dreaming and it was definitely challenging. Um, and there were three working groups that came out of that and the one that had the most energy was the mapping working group people continue to ask questions and while we're doing the work we all wanted to know what everyone else was doing and so um we are in the final stages of completing those network maps and we want to make that public because we want this to be an emergent network that people want to connect and build relationships with each other and we can be the container for that to happen. And from there, we also hope to collect oral histories and stories so that we can hear what people are saying about what does a national truth and reconciliation process mean. And I think that Restorative Justice for Oakland Youth, our joy as an organization, we have the capacity uh, to do that, but we also recognize that this is, this is very much about that value and that practice of Ubuntu, being connected to each other, that our liberation is bounded together, right? And so we have to create space for people to build deeper relationships and hear from communities what does truth and reconciliation look like. And I think the commission, um, you know, in the hearings in Memphis is going to be an incredible roadmap to teach us, teach us so much, right? And I'm, so I'm really excited to just be in the presence of folks who are opening themselves up to the experience and recognizing their stories as wisdom for transformation of our systems. Um, and one of the organizations that I actually want to uplift is coming to the table that I currently serve as the board president of coming to the table brings together the descendants of those that were enslaved and who were enslavers. Um, and we've used our coming to the table model, our four pillars of uncovering history, making connections, moving towards action, uh, moving towards healing and taking action to kind of guide this reparations work that we have been doing. The working group, and I know some members are on here right now, has put a lot of deep work in and really thought about reparations both in a, both in a personal way, but also community and societal. And I feel like there's also so much dreaming within that guide as well um, to think about what does reparations look like when we talk about economic reparations we're also we're often talking about this idea of richness and not wealth that you can give people a check but how are we talking about wealth and the expansion and growing of our communities and even when we talk about what it means to give back land what are we doing with that land like what does it mean for that land to be a safe enough space for people to feel free without systems granting that freedom right so we are i think Reparations, when I think about the imagination and the dreaming, it is a path and a practice of liberation and freedom um, and systemic transformation. And last thing I want to name is that that cannot, um, that cannot happen fully under capitalism, that we need to dispense our structure and system of capitalism. I think that's one of the evils that we need to name, that in order for true reparations to take place or any kind of true healing, we need to dismantle capitalism 
because under systems and structures of capitalism, there are always people who are disposable and seen as nobodies. And within our system, so many, you know, the prison industrial complex, um, police terrorism saw Mike Brown as nobody. Mark Lamont Hill really uplifts this in his book. And I think when we talk about this idea of a thing, right, that's what he was seen as a thing. There was a disposability of a human life. And we are now saying that is no longer acceptable. And we are reimagining and dreaming what liberation and transformation looks like. And that is not bound by any system or structure. And so I just really want us to think about that with intention. It might sound good and it might feel good right now. You might nod your head, but we are dismantling a system that all of us benefit from on some level. And we have to break away from that and give up a certain amount of privilege as well. So thank you. Thank you so much, Jody. Um, Every time I hear you talk, I'm just, uh, of course, inspired uh, just by your dopeness and um, just the vision you have. Um, I don't think when I was your age, I had that vision, but, um, and just want to thank all of our elders once again, and Reverend Johnson and Chrissy. And now um, we're going to open it up for questions. And I'm also posting uh, some directions for questions. Uh, this call is scheduled to go on for another 30 minutes. So we're going to have about um, a few minutes. Um, so there's a feature on the right of your screen. Um, I have a Mac, so it might be uh, different on, a, um, on something else. Or if you're on the phone, if you can send an email um, to F-O-R-U-S-A, um, Ethan, what's the email that people on the phone can send if they have a question so they can let us know? Um, FOR at FORUSA.org. If you are on the phone and have a question, you can send your question to FOR at FORUSA.org. If, if you are on this call via the video feature, again, there is a write a feature on the right hand side raise your hand and we will call on you for your question um, in order um, but maybe in the meantime uh, what we can do is Ethan uh, I know some people had asked questions earlier uh, have sent in questions um, and uh, if you can um, share any of those questions that make sense right now based on this conversation. Again, um, you can also uh, email, uh, but you can also tweet um, at Truth Tellers USA a question and at FOR Peace. Um, and those are in the chat feature. And <laughs> Hey, Chrissy, us, um, you can't really email to us by S K Can you hear me? Chrissy, Chrissy, yeah, you're you're messing up a bit. Uh, Can you maybe hear me a bit better now? Perfect, perfect. That's good. All right, great. So, um, our best. First question was emailed to us by SK Shabaka. Um, so in effort to achieve true reparations for people of African descent in the US, what should be the roles of African supporters, progressive white supporters um, during this movement, given the historical roles played by such during uh, COINTEL Pro? So do any of our panelists, would any of our, um, panelists like to answer that. And actually, I misread that. Let me read that one more time. Um, in effort to achieve true reparations for people of African descent in the US, what should be the roles of African American leadership, sympathetic non-African supporters, and progressive white supporters during this movement, given the historical roles um, played by COINTELPRO? Um, and why don't, why don't we just go down the, the line and if, if there are more questions, let's collect those questions and then 
um, we'll give everyone a chance to respond uh, to that. So we have one question so far um, that we just shared, and I'm just looking to see if there are any hands raised. Um, Ethan, are, are there any uh, responses on Twitter? Um, I have um, quite a few questions here too. Would you guys like the next question? Yeah. Okay, so the second question is was sent anonymously. What form or forms of reparations should be achieved and what structures should be put into place given the role of the US government and businesses with ties and profit who have ties and have profited during slavery and their historic records in breaking treaties and promises? Hmm. And maybe let's hear uh, one more and then uh, we'll give um, our panelists a chance, uh, just like a, a, about a minute or two each to respond to those two. Okay. And I have one more. It's, um, it's a bit longer question, but I think it's, it's a good one. So um, someone, an anonymous, um, person wrote in, my family still owns a piece of property that clearly had slavery there. While they began leasing in 1894 and bought it in 1917 with money made by a relative who worked in General Motors in the early days, it is still a plantation. The family identity is very tied up with owning it. Most of it now is an environmental and education easement, uh, an easement or trust now but not much education happens there. A small portion is privately owned by their dad and uncle. And I know some people who plan to sell their portions um, of the property and donate the money to organizations run by people of color or to local, community, uh, local organizations run by people of color. But with this property, even if even sold, if the money goes into a charitable trust run by 10 different family members who will likely not agree that some sort of reparations ought to be made. So alternatively, perhaps some education could happen on the place about slavery. But again, I'm dealing with family that is not likely to be swayed in this area. Any suggestions? Is it better to divorce oneself from the family hoping to have incremental small micro reparations where they can even these questions feel like they are more about me says the individual and justice regarding the plantation and making resources available to people whose ancestors lost so much but i don't know how to make that happen so again the questions are um what are your suggestions for this person and is it better to divorce themselves from the property or stay in the game and hope that the family, or hope that they will have incremental small micro reparations when they can? Mm, um, so dope, thank you for sharing those, Chrissy. And then I wanna add one more. What about reparations for Native Americans and how do reparations to African American and Native Americans intersect? Great question. All right, so we're gonna um, start off with our panel and we're just gonna go down the list and start with Dr. Carruthers. Um, would you like to um, begin us in thinking about that? And then we'll just go from Dr. Carruthers to that, Dr. Uh, Shabazz, then to Reverend Lucas, and then to Sister Jody. Uh, Dr. Carruthers. And I, let me unmute you. Yeah, okay. Yeah, Okay. I was saying uh, in the interest of time, of course, we will be brief. And these are some very uh, deep questions that deserve a lot of attention. I'll start with uh, the first one I'll respond to around the historical role. And I would just like to suggest that I think there are two important ways for us to think about um, this process of reparations around the role of Africans, quote, from the continent, who are in the diaspora, I think that was the point of the question, as well as white allies. And so I think that we should um, see how useful it is to understand that there is internal damage 
that has to be done and has to be addressed, uh, acknowledged and addressed. And then there are those external forces. And so the consequence of the internal woundedness, I think, deserves attention that requires Africans of the diaspora and continental Africans, wherever they find themselves, to come together in ways that focus on the remembering that is a response to the dismembering that was a part of the global transatlantic slave trade. And so I think it gets back to a recognition that this is a global action plan that is required for us to deal with. I think that same question around internal damage of raising the question of what has happened to white allies, potential allies, what has happened within the white European world community likewise deserves conversations within that community around the nature of the loss of, of human spirit, the loss of a sense of what it means to live in the construct of Ubuntu, um, the, the capacity to struggle with what it means to address the deconstruction of capitalism, for example. And, and how the beneficial uh, gains which have been transgenerational are going to require of uh, people who uh, are, are on uh, by birth uh, the pathway of privilege, a different kind of conversation that they have to have. And then I think coming to the table makes sense, but I think you cannot do the coming to the table and the external piece if you don't acknowledge the internal piece as well. And so I think the role of both uh, Africans of the continent vis-a-vis -vis the conversation of reparations in the United States speaks to, in part, how there can be uh, persons of African um, ancestry coming together around their shared experiences and their different experiences and what the implications that has for reparations. I think the role of white allies is, is, is largely uh, has to be framed as what it means to understand and to grapple with privilege and power um, and being able to be in a space of otherness, which is a very difficult challenge that grows out of living in privilege. Okay, um, thank you. I, I would add, um, to that, uh, particularly coming at the question, uh, the big macro level question, that um, I've been putting some links uh, to pieces that you might find uh, useful, particularly on the on the corporate reparations um, um, piece. One of the links didn't work, so I went and found the uh, actual uh, text of the case of uh, uh, Deidre Farmer Pellman versus Fleet Boston Financial uh, from 2002, just so you could read that. I'm also posting, and this is also very important as to what uh, allies or anyone want, wants, how they could help. Um, the HR 40, the Commission to Study and Develop Reparation Proposals for African Americans Act, was introduced into the current um, um, uh, House um, House Judiciary Committee uh, January 2017, so a year ago in January. I don't know the status um, in terms of co-sponsors, and now that um, uh, Representative Conyers is uh, out of his seat or, or given up his seat, um, what will happen in terms of the, uh, the follow on to that and the continuing, um, uh, continuing to put that forward into the 116th Congress. Um, but, that, but the one from 115th, I've sent you the, le the link. You can see it there for, your, for yourself. Uh, it's in the name of James Conyers, but he did have um, um, the, my old former representative from Texas. Uh, in fact, when he was a justice of peace, he married my wife and I, that's a side note, but Representative Al Green is a signator um, of, uh, of that House resolution. And there's several others who've signed on, Sheila Jackson Lee, also from Texas. So uh, hopefully if they keep House Resolutions 40 uh, going, 
what any ally can do, anybody, white, black, Native American, it doesn't matter, talk to your congressman, talk, talk to your congresswoman, talk to your senator, and ask them, see if they've signed on, ask them to help support it, get it out of the judiciary, move it forward. This is not a bill saying the U.S. government is going to pay reparations. This is simply a bill to commission a study. And this is where all major legislation begins. It begins with a study that is done, uh, paid for by the government, that is, uh, brings together the best scholars, the best minds, the best researchers to put together proposals, to put together the history, to put together proposals, looking at what uh, Germany did after World War II for the various uh, uh, parties that were injured by the Nazi regime, looking at those, looking at others in the cases in the 20th century, looking at the Japanese Reparations Act that, that actually came out of the House, of, uh, out of the federal government. That was the product of a study, first off, that studied what happened, who were the actual injured parties uh, um, in the 1940s when Japanese citizens in the United States were sequestered into uh, concentration camps, were, were, were administratively segregated from the rest of society, taken out of their homes, taken out of their neighborhoods, and put. So the reparations that came there, it started with a study. And the same can happen for Native Americans. Native Americans, however, you have to understand, are, are, are sovereign, are people who have struggled and maintained their sovereign sovereignty. So there's a sovereign relationship through various treaties that, have, that, that, that already exist. So to talk about continued damages and harms and reparations for Native Americans, that's a, that's a whole other conversation, but it has to go through the fact that these Native American nations in this country have their sovereignty. So you have to look at questions of, uh, of the, the history of treaties, treaties that were broken, and make a case that starts from there. So I can't come in and say, oh, let's talk about reparations for Native Americans. They have nations. You'd have to go to the Cherokee Nation and talk to the Cherokee Nation about what they want vis-a-vis -vis the federal government. You'd have to go to the Choctaw, go to the Chickasaw, go to the various Native American nations. So I don't want to overdetermine or lump people who have their sovereignty intact and struggle for that sovereignty right now vis-a-vis -vis the U.S. So we have to listen to them and find out what, how they want to approach it before we go in and talk about a reparations paradigm for, 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 for our indigenous uh, First Nations in, uh, in the territory called the United States today. But let's come back to African Americans. There is a bill. There is House Resolution 40. Let's get it out of the judiciary. Let's get a vote. Let's get people to be able to vote it up or down in the House and in the Senate. And that's where allies can come forward and ask their representative, ask their senator, hey, where are you on this? How can we push this forward? And especially if in 2018, that's going to be a big change election, then, then, then let's make that part of the platform for people who want our support in 2018 that are challenging some of these seats by, by sexual predators and by uh, supporters of, of, of sexual predators and whatnot that are right now, seats are gonna be challenged in 2018. Bring to them an additional question about HR 40 and will you, when you go in there, support that, work for that, bring that forward. So for me, that is an action step. And that is an action step that all allies, all people, can get behind. You don't have to ask anybody black for permission to do that, okay? You can just do it and support us. It's a bill in the Congress now. Let's support it. Let's get behind it. Let's go to our church groups. Let's go to our social groups. Let's go to our fraternities, our sororities, everywhere, and get position statements, aka Incorporated, Delta Sigma Theta Incorporated, down the line, okay? All the great churches, down the line. All the great groups, Fellowship of Reconciliation, down the line, pass a statement, put it out there on your website, your Twitter feed, your social media, and say, we support HR 40. We want this bill to move and commission a study. Now, let me tell you, 
for me, and I, and I know many other scholars, we've been doing this work for free. So we're not trying to push this commission study, this, this money for this study, because it's going to be something to put in our pockets. Uh, uh, but, but, yet, but things do cost money to hire research assistants, to hire grad students, to hire people, to get this materials together to be uh, presented to the Congress, that does take money and that's what this bill provides. So that link, you can go across, you can see the summary, you can click text and see the actual text of the bill, you can see the various actions that have been taken on the bill um, uh, uh, from when it was introduced in the House on January 3rd. Uh, uh, the titles, the, uh, there are no amendments, co-sponsors, there are 28 co-sponsors, get your representative, get your senator, on there as a uh, 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 well, representative, as a sponsor. Get someone in the Senate to do a parallel bill in the Senate. That's an action step, moving from conversation to action. Thank you. Can I just Can add just to add that, that, that we should also we should note also the note site, the, the Institute of the Black World, because for the last year, we as a part of the commission have been working with uh, Representative Conyers office to do a HR 40 B and it is essentially to um, put into context where we are historically now given the kind of historical narrative that you gave to talk about where we really need to go in terms of next steps. So I would encourage everyone to stay abreast of that website to get the most current information because uh, Conyers office has been a uh, supportive of a revisioning of that for this time. Thank you. And I will add, uh, uh, thank you for that. The, the work uh, we had at National Council for Black Studies about three years ago, we had as our keynote plenary speaker, uh, Brother Ron Daniels. We follow very closely the work of, the, uh, of NARC. Um, we have people who were there in New Orleans at the meeting in New Orleans that was just recently held and, and Hillary Beckles and major thing, major people came forward and presented at that. So we follow very closely the work of the commission and, and the work of uh, uh, the Institute of the Black World. Thank you for that. Reverend Lucas. Um, I'm learning so much, I'm forgetting that I'm supposed to be a panelist. Uh, I, I, <laughs> I'm so grateful for, for, for that, Dr. Shabazz. Um, I, uh, so uh, I have a couple of different, I, I won't respond to all the questions. Uh, a couple of responses came to mind. Uh, one is that uh, particularly with respect to the, the conversation about uh, the role of white allies and um, uh, and I want to speak to that particularly. I think that um, one of the things, and also, I, I think I want to speak also to the, the question with, with respect to the Native Americans. Um, to me, one of the things that I've noticed is that there is something that is so, um, it triggers so much um, from uh, majority populations in the United States and in Europe uh, it, it does something in particular when African descendants start to push for their white rights or start to talk about issues of justice. It triggers some, a, a visceral reaction that, that, that is, is really r remarkable to witness. And I'm calling attention to that because I, I believe that if we were to achieve such a revolution in con of consciousness in the United States that, or, 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 or in other places, that, that something, that, that, a, that a, a house bill on reparations, for example, could even be discussed, uh, or, or that, or that the, the, the public in general was even discussing it, it will represent a, a certain shift in, in, in the body politic. And I think that shift in the body politic will have, will also mean and will happen simultaneously with, and will also create a, sort of a ripple effect and space for other groups struggling for their rights and their dignity and their freedom. I, I, so I guess what I'm getting at is that I don't think that, I think that it's often the case that people 
seem to approach these types of conversations as an either or, as, as, if, as if to, you know, to focus on black liberation is to, is to somehow deny liberation for other peoples. And, and, and I, don't, I don't think it's that, I, that's, I don't think that's, that's the case. I think it's quite the opposite. The other thing that I'll say um, is that, um, you know, th there was a reference to COINTELPRO. And, and one of the things that I'm also ex noticing and experiencing is the fact that I don't even think COINTELPRO is necessary anymore in terms of, for them to accomplish their aims. <laughs> I, think, I think one of the things that's happened is that um, the, the, the so the economic interests, the 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 the, the, the power interests, the, the 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 white supremacy has become so entrenched, and has become so um, fundamental to the national myths of of of, of, of many places that it's gotten people believing so naturally in in in, in lies. And I think that's something that we have to contend with. And I think that's, that's gonna be a part of this journey. And I think that this sort of, this process of recovery, this process of remembering um, is also something that I think our white allies are going to have to participate in. I think that, I think that there's gonna to have to be a revisiting of the, of the revisionist history after the Civil War, for example. There's gonna be, need to be a revisioning and a, re -under, a reorientation around the different stories that are told about, about the history of the United States. That's something that everyone can participate in while we're having these conversations. Um, I think I'm, I'm too tired to remember the other questions well, so I'm gonna stop there. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you all again. Um, um, I'm particularly thinking about the question around the family and property. Um, how do I say this? To be clear, I think that you need to stay at the table. Um, you have choice to leave the table. And I think when you have the choice to leave is the moment that you decide to stay. Um, and so I want to name that clearly that you need to stay at the table and be at that table with family. Um, but also taking it a step further, and I'm not sure if you've done this because um, it's not named in the question, but just taking it a step further and uncovering the history of your family and the relationships of that land and what was done on that land and who are the descendants that once were enslaved on that land, I think it's particularly important. Um, that's a part of the work that we do in coming to the table when we think about uncovering history that is incredibly essential to how we move forward. What does it mean to look back to move forward thinking about Sankofa? And so I think not just speculating or knowing um, the history of that land, but the history of the people who were enslaved in that land, I think is really important um, to stay at the table. And when the moment comes that the land is released from that family's hands, you don't need to sell it, it needs to be given away. That like we need to think about what it, what it means um, to give without chains or attachments. Um, something, just something for me in terms of selling pieces of the land had a visceral reaction. It's like you will still be benefiting from that system of capitalism by selling the land to folks who um, are descendants of those that were enslaved. So I would just name, give the land away, give it up, but um, stay at the table because you have the choice to leave. Um, and I think that's important. Um, I definitely agree so much with Lucas um, around the ways in which we either choosing the liberation of black folks or the liberation of Native Americans. Um, and it doesn't have to be either or that those things can happen and function in the same space. And I think there, the nobodiness of black folks in America um, throughout history has been this way for us to disappear, the ways in which we've kind of erased Native Americans in terms of what we are seeing, what we're hearing, what we're talking about. Um, but particularly when it comes to Black folks, we've been kind of this Black pain against a white canvas, as Claudia Rankin would name it. Um, and so for me, I believe that the liberation of Black folks is, is leading and in many ways is the liberation of um, groups who are on the margins and even on the margins of the margins. And so I think it's also important to name the ways in which white allies engage in oppression Olympics, that we begin 
to compete um, in who's lit, who is oppression is worse, right? And then we begin to prioritize that particular group without recognizing the ways in which we're replicating the harms that the system has taught us to do, right? That there are ways in which we can be in deep community and relationship with each other and still center particular voices and groups. Um, and just to name that the work that our joy is doing around the mapping is particularly around violence against African Americans. And we've had to name that very clear because often um, when we show up in spaces and white allies ask about what about Native Americans, what about poor whites, it's a way to not also talk about the central issue, like who is a scapegoat for oppression and racism and capitalism in the United States and we're talking about black folks. And we need to name what exists. This is a part of the naming, saying no, this is where we are right now and we are not gonna engage in this distraction. And that also naming that um, speaks so that the liberation of black folks is a part of the liberation of so many more. Um, and I think that's just important for us to be able to uplift, but just also for anyone on this call that has the privilege of choice, that you stay at those tables simply because you have the choice to leave. I think that's really important to, to make that call and do your uncovering history. It's not enough to just believe or speculate, but go a step further of knowing of digging and getting to the root and making those connections, right? When you know what you know, you begin to make those connections. You just don't leave it there. You don't just let those pieces of information and evidence pile up that there was a duty to tell that story and create space for others who've experienced it to speak into it. Um, <clears throat> this is uh, David Raglan and I just want to, so just so much deep gratitude for um, what we heard today. Um, for um, just uh, folks who are thinking about the history and thinking about where we've come and just the dimensions, uh, the global dimensions and the moral dimensions and spiritual dimensions um, that require us to think um, deeply and not um, come down on, well, this is what reparations requires me to do right now. It requires you to be engaged and to stay at the table, um, like uh, Sister Jody has, has just mentioned, uh, but also to stay tuned um, because we've made a commitment to thinking deeply and pushing forward um, not just a conversation, but um, an agenda around reparations. And right now, um, one of the purposes of this conversation was to begin um, seeing how do we be a part of the chorus um, that is pushing for us to, um, to connect and to um, think deeply and to realize that we have a part, um, a part and a responsibility in dealing with um, addressing our complicity in evil. And I, I just really appreciate um, um, Dr. Carruthers naming that um, and that this is global um, and that we have to remember um, and we have to figure out how to move beyond um, this kind of objectification and the thingification. Um, that when you thingify someone uh, when, when you are mute around the murders of African Americans or anybody, um, you, you allow folks to be thingified. And, and the fact that folks are here on this call means that they're interested in staying at the table. And we've, we've been, you know, we've been dreaming big um, in our conversations and uh, we've thought about what does reparations look like um, and what, what, what would it mean now? And some of the examples are, you know, I want to just name some of the folks like um, the Southern Reparations Loan Fund. They're working on things now. How do we survive and how do we deal with what's now? And there, there are other ways other than the legal route. Um, you know, and just as an example, uh, one of my colleagues uh, mentioned 
you know, what if every single organization, white social justice organization dedicated 10 to 20% of their budgets or of their space or whatever capacity that they have to black liberation? Just just a question. So um, please stay tuned uh, for the folks who register. You're here on this call because you're registered. We will uh, continue to keep you all informed and we'll also, this will be made available for some of the folks who couldn't make it. Um, and we'll also uh, make sure you all know what we're doing next. Um, so if you can, two places where you can look is um, our Twitter address, Truth Teller USA, uh, Truth Tellers USA and FOR Peace. And uh, stay tuned and deep thanks uh, for um, everybody who was a part of this conversation. Um, I just want to name everybody once more. Uh, Dr. Iva Carruthers, um, Dr. Amokar Shabazz, Reverend Lucas Johnson, Sister Jody Geddes, uh, Sister Chrissy Jackson, um, and all of you all, thank you. We've uh, run out of time, uh, but there are more questions and we will make sure that we make them available to uh, the speakers and make sure that if they have final comments as well, uh, we will make that available to you all. Deep thanks uh, and for your presence. You could have been somewhere else and you here. <laughs>